two of those right, right away. Should I start now? All right, good evening, everyone. First and foremost, thank you for coming out tonight on Thursday on a winter night on break week, which I want to recognize for parents who are here tonight that I recognize and understand that it is break week. And we have a lot of dates, um, important dates that are coming up in the district regarding the budget and also the SRO contract. So we had very limited time and when we could do this. Um, but this training will be online. It will be on the Rochester City School District's budget page. It will be on our social media and it'll also be on YouTube. We do have childcare um, right in the back through those hall right over there to the right. Um, Ms. Khadija is raising her hand. So there is free child care. They are watching a movie. There's kids over there. Um, so please feel free to utilize that. Um, where are the bathrooms? I just want to note. So they're right by child care. So you'd go out these doors to the back, to the right, and men and women's bathroom are there. So Welcome again, everyone. My name is Beatrice LeBron. I am one of the seven commissioners on the Rochester City School Board. And this year, um, so let me just explain a little bit. I just became the finance chair this year. Part of our process to be more engaging with the community is changing how we have done the entire process. So in a very short amount of time, this is one of the changes, but next year's goal will be to not only do these budget trainings and presentations at, at the schools, but also the actual budget conversations and hearings at schools. So bear with me while we work through that because it is a, it's a big undertaking. I do think it's possible and doable to split it up among the board members and different administrations and send teams out through all of their schools that they're the liaison for, but it takes a little bit of time. So again, thank you. So for this year, we are doing a budget training and I'll be starting with a quick overview. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit more about how our funding, how our funding comes in and an overview of how the funding is spent and in the areas that it's spent. And then I'm gonna turn it over to our new CFO, Robert Franklin. And then we have a question and answer session and then we're closing. Now we did some, um, have a Google form online for online question submissions. And I'm gonna kick off one of the questions now, which was test. So if someone out there in the community sent a test page, we got it. And I don't have to answer that one. Um, so we're going to go right into it. So we can categorize our, this is specifically for RCSD. Um, and we can categorize our school system spending into five major categories. So this is the areas where most of our spending is allocated. So instruction, total resources spent on classroom instructional activities, and examples of that are on the bottom. So that's teachers' compensation, charter school tuition, and special education. And one of the key takeaways with the instruction piece, and you see charter school tuition, is that the Rochester City School District Board is not a chartering um, authorizing board. And I'm grateful for that, but there are some school boards across the state where the board authorizes the charter schools or they may or may not set the tuition. We, we have nothing to do with charters being authorized as a school board. We also have no say in the tuition that we have to pay. So New York State sets that amount and we are a pass-through organization. Whatever New York State says we have to pay for tuition is what we have to pay. In addition to that, um, we are still responsible for special education services in charter schools, transportation, curriculum, and any IT material. So that does have an impact on us, and I just want to share that because it's part of instruction, but it falls under other categories as well. Employee benefits are the total resources that we provide to our employees based on collective bargaining agreements and New York State labor laws. So health insurance, dental, retirement plans, and social security. 
Transportation, the total resources provided directly to support students in schools. Again, contract transportation, district transportation. We also have to maintain any of the vehicles that we own with maintenance and fuel. So there is additional costs set to that. And again, charter schools would fall under our transportation costs as well, even though they're listed over there for just tuition. Um, Operation, so total resources spent on providing operational supports to schools and districts, so IT, facilities, maintenance, gas, and electric. Um, staff resources, so total resources spent on salaries for school principals, security, administrative, staff, and schools. So curriculum writing, payments to teachers to attend professional development, and accountability staff. And this slide will have our actual percentages moving forward in the actual budget once that budget is released so that everyone has an understanding of the percentages of our entire budget and how they fall into these five categories. We're gonna wait to the end, yes. Um, so what is funded at central office that supports schools? Um, and let me just share that one of the things I want answered moving forward in the budget book is also what are the things that are in central office that are there that don't support schools or support them indirectly because I would want to know that. Um, so finance, the finance department, they're responsible for the budget, payroll, grants management, the Office of Accountability, so they're responsible for testing and student records, human resources for hiring and benefits, central services, which is food services, transportation, operation of buildings, utility costs, rent, distribution center, IMNT, so technologies in the classroom, technology for students, online learning, and data systems. So this is a breakdown of our funding and how it comes in from the state. And just so folks know, in the budget book this year, we will break down this 12.9% from the city. That is equivalent to the 119 million. I know a lot of folks, um, we're gonna break these down further once our actual budget book is developed. Um, so we get other 1.9%, other could be um, special grants and so forth, but federal makes up 8.1%, the city makes up 12.9%, and the state makes 77.1% of our, our budget and our income coming in, our revenues. So an effective funding system is critical to enabling strategic resource use. So equity, resources are distributed equitable based on student needs. So in Rochester, this is no secret. We, you hear this all the time and we say this m multiple times because it's true for our population. More than 20% of our students um, include students with disabilities. Uh, Rochester is one of the poorest cities in the state and the nation. And more than 50% of our children in the city of Rochester are living in poverty. And this makes up our, our students. So transparency, clear and easily understood rules for where, how, and why dollars flow. So during this budget cycle, the district will act decisively and quickly in order to achieve and maintain fiscal stability. And I have to say, and I just wanna clarify that the decisively and quickly is really related to the important key dates which are posted over here. Um, so if you look at these dates over here, we're having this session today, but really March 12th until May, sorry, they, they're on the handouts too, on the back of the trifolds, but March through May, by May 7th, um, we really, that's not a lot of time to go through an entire budget and cut and closing, you know, talk about closing the deficit. And so it is a very short amount of time. Some of these dates are also related to by law, the dates we have to have the budget in by and the amount of time that city hall and city council gets to have the budget. So that's the steps in the budget process. So the superintendent and the district and administration prepare the budget. That is their responsibility, and that's happening right now. So it is their responsibility to do that. The board then receives the draft budget proposal. We will get one for the East EPO. Um, he'll present his budget on March 12th. The superintendent will present his on March 17th. On budget deliberations on Thursday, March 25th, we have another budget town hall. 
it will be set up so that folks in the community can come and share whatever they want to share, any feedback, any ideas, any questions on things that you're seeing in the budget, but an opportunity to get some answers right then and there too. Um, and then Thursday, April 2nd, will be the first budget public hearing that'll happen at Central Office. That is typically where the Rochester's uh, the school board and access the administration questions. So we purposely try to stagger it right before it too because if there is a question that cannot be answered, um, I'm going to figure out a way that we can collect those questions and have them asked to administration by April 2nd, so we can get some answers. Um, April 14th, April 16th, so back-to-back -back deliberations, and then a budget, the second budget deliberation session is April 30th, the special board meeting for budget adoption, that this is when the Rochester City School District Board will vote on the budget, is May 7th, um, and then it goes over to City Council, and there is a joint budget hearing where city council then gets an opportunity to go over the budget and ask administration questions about the budget. And then the final date for them to vote on is June 16th. That is when city council will vote on the budget. Um, so yeah. Now I'm gonna pass it over to our CFO. Well, Commissioner, Commissioner LeBron is a much more engaging speaker than I, so uh, bear with me. Okay, looking at the, the budget book. Um, thank you. Uh, looking at our budget book, uh, section one really is our uh, introduction and overview. Uh, there's just a few things in there, uh, a little bit dry. Uh, as Commissioner LeBron was just talking about, City Council actually approves our budget. Um, you probably know, but for those of you who may not, um, this is basically because the city of Rochester levies the school tax on our behalf. We don't levy our own tax, and the city council actually has to approve the funding that it provides to the city school district. Uh, you'll also find in our transmittal letter to um, Mayor Warren, uh, that letter basically just outlines the goals and objectives that the district is intended to support and the district budget is intended to support. And you also find in that section a reader's guide on how to understand the budget book. Uh, you'll also find in there uh, an executive summary for those of you who don't want to read the entire 500-page book uh, in an organizational chart showing uh, who, does, who does what within our district. Uh, section two of the budget book, not a very thick section, uh, really goes over the district's uh, mission, vision, a uh, variety of board policies, um, the board policies included in the budget book relate really to our budgetary process and financial accountability. You're not going to find all the board policies in there, just those that pertain to finance and budgeting. And then really information on enrollment trends, our union agreements. Um, there's actually five unions in the city school district uh, representing our employees. Two of our unions um, have contracts that have actually already expired and are currently being negotiated. Uh, we have a third union contract that will be expiring at the end of this school year, uh, so we'll be taking on that negotiation as well. Section three of the budget book, one of my favorites uh, because it provides a complete overview of the school district's uh, budgeting. Um, although it's a relatively thin section, uh, it really is chock full of information. Um, you'll see in there um, all the district revenue sources and a written explanation that describes what each of those revenue sources is actually for. Uh, you'll also see within there, uh, that particular section, every grant that the city school district is budgeting. And you'll also see a written explanation of um, what services those grants are intended to provide. Uh, we, in this section, we also provide the detail of each type of budgetary expense, and we also include a brief explanation of the major changes from year to year in those expenses. And finally, in this section, um, this is also where you're going to find our projection um, for the next uh, three years of our revenues and expenses. 
Uh, you'll see the general assumptions we uh, take in using those projections uh, and the efforts that the district will need to employ in order to ensure that our expenses remain in line with our projected revenues. Not an easy task. Section four is probably the meat and potatoes of our budget book. Um, these are, this contains our school profiles in budget. Uh, it's on pro probably of most interest to of most of our parents. Uh, for the upcoming budget, you know, in the prior budgets have been organized a little differently. The most recent budget, our school section, has been organized by the chief of schools who's in charge of those. For the upcoming budget, we're actually looking to organize a little differently. Um, you see on this the three zones of the city school district. So um, we're actually thinking about organizing our schools by zone and perhaps um, we'll have some color coding or other visual indicator because um, usually parents are looking for their, the school that their child goes to. So hopefully we'll make it a little easier or a little more quickly to find the school that's of interest. Um, each school will have um, its estimated uh, spending, staffing, and enrollment, and its revenue sources. Um, and you'll see uh, some accountability data as well, some student performance data. Uh, similar to what you saw last year. Section five of our budget book, you know, not all education is taught in a brick and mortar building. We have a number of alternative programs. Um, some of our programs serve students from all over the city of Rochester. Uh, some of our programs and educational services are delivered at multiple locations. Uh, so those programs that have uh, greater applicability um, and wide-ranging through our district are presented in Section 5. Uh, for each of those programs, you will see a description of the services that that, pro that program provides. You'll see the program's goals and objectives for the upcoming year. Uh, you'll also see for each program its measures of success and its budgeted revenues and expenses, of course. Section six, another favorite section, it's our administrative section, the section that finance belongs to. Um, this section of the budget book has all of our administrative areas, again, finance. It also includes um, our board of education, it includes the superintendent's office and his chief of operations and staff, chief of service, chief of staff and deputy. Uh, it does include our facilities and operations department, our law department, and our human resources, our human capital initiatives. Uh, each of these areas, like the schools, will have a description of the particular administrative functions that are provided, uh, the budgeted expenses needed to perform those administrative functions, and the staff employed who actually perform those functions. So section seven's a little different, but you are probably used to seeing it. It's uh, for East High School. It's really not included in section four with all the other schools. It is a little unique. Um, as it's been described, it is uh, like a school district within a school district. Our East Educational Partnership Organization, um, nonetheless, is, uh, has its own section. And like the other schools, you will find a description of what the EPO actually is and what it does. And you will see its budgeted revenues, its budgeted expenses, and its projected enrollment and staffing. Our district-wide profiles and budgets are in section eight. These are a little, um, not exactly administrative by nature, but they're um, budgeted areas that pertain to all the employees or throughout the district. Really, the district's debt service and our employee benefits, such as health, medical, uh, dental, unemployment, social security. Um, we, budget these, we budget these centrally. Um, the staff tend to uh, transfer uh, between schools from year to year. Um, it's just a lot, it's a lighter administrative burden to budget these items more centrally. Uh, and then, as the year goes on, we do charge the actual expenses based on where the particular employees reside. Um, our debt service 
represents the annual repayment of borrowed funds, both the principal and the interest. Uh, it's roughly 9% of the overall budget. Um, the employee health benefits and a variety of insurances is roughly 19% of the district's annual budget. Section 9. Section 9 is a little thicker section. It's not an operating budget. It's a capital, capital budget. It includes our capital improvement plan. It's a pretty comprehensive document. It identifies uh, building conditions, uh, structural maintenance needs, uh, other rehabilitative work that is required for our buildings, and the work that is performed uh, based on anticipated enrollment trends. Um, that work is also based on building capacity, building utilization, and perhaps changes in upcoming programming needs. Uh, for the projects to be undertaken, the plan provides a plan for financing. It's laid out by the accounts um, that are eligible for reimbursement. It also takes into account and projects the legal limits that the district has on debt, uh, financial market conditions, and the district's ability to repay those borrowed funds. Uh, for the school that your child attends, or your grandchild, or your neighbor, you can find uh, particular projects that are going on at any particular school uh, that will be taking place within the next five years. Lastly is our appendices that are found in section 10 of the budget book. Um, there's a variety of appen uh, appendices here. Um, they're really um, either budget-related or performance-related. Uh, the performance-related appendices kind of give you a flavor of the outcomes that are being generated uh, for the students we serve, both at a program level and a school level, and a variety of demographic information that um, slices and dices our student population ten different ways. That really concludes uh, my portion of the presentation. So if you have questions, I notice uh, all our board commissioners are in attendance tonight. Uh, and there's the contact information via email that uh, your board member can be reached. Commissioner? So we're going to um, open it up for questions. And I also want to read some of the questions that were submitted online, because we are recording this so it could be public as well and public record. Um, so anybody has a question? Would they like to go first? Yes, Ms. Cunningham. Hi. Hi. Oh, let me get, let, oh. We're going to give you a mic, because we're recording. And we want people who are watching to be able to. Okay, Reverend Cunningham, pastor of Gray's Memorial CME Church. I guess my question is on the um, charter school um, with the budget. I think you said that you really don't, kind of explain it to me. I don't want to say something and you didn't say it. Yeah, um, so. Do, you, do, do the district pay their salaries, the teachers? We pay a tuition. That tuition amount For is For the set. student? For the student, and okay. that is set based on New York. The New York State legislation, they, they set the amount. New York State tells us what the tuition reimbursement rate will be for the charter. Um, so I share that because sometimes people think that the school board has a say in what that tuition amount is, and we don't. We, we, we literally have to follow what the New York State tells us to follow. Okay, even though you have quite a lot to do with the kids that have IEPs, I, you I, still don't have Have any? no say, no okay. say in how much we pay them and no say in what happens at the schools. Okay, and my other question, uh, just for clarity, um, in, in previous budgets, was that taken into consideration concerning the charter schools? Because I know we're in the bind that we're in now. I just want to know, um, in previous budgets, since we're in a place this year where we haven't been in quite a while, um, have the charter school situation been taken into consideration? You, yeah. Um, you want to take that? You want me to take it? Here. We're well, both we going to take team. it. We're going to tag team. I just, I just want clarity. Uh, our budget director and I were just talking about the charter schools uh, before the meeting started. 
Um, we do pay the tuition. We are responsible for a variety of payments, including um, uh, textbooks, uh, computer hardware and software, uh, transportation. Uh, so there's a variety of, of costs that uh, the city school district um, pays for, but does receive state aid. I think the biggest challenge the district faces, um, perhaps one of the biggest challenges the district faces with charter school has been the growth in charter school enrollment over the past several years. Um, I did look earlier today, to trends for the past three years, on average it's about 6.6 percent increase in enrollment uh, annual average. So I think the district's ability to respond to such um, a rapid growth is difficult. Um, and I think that's why you're seeing some of the um, strange strains the district is experiencing from a capital and building perspective. Anything to add? And also, uh, not well, to go right back up, but can you get her mic? With the new uh, information plan that was put in place last year by special ed, um, by Keisha Morgan, was that taken into consideration? because things had to have been done a little bit different, um, the way how that plan was put out, so, and the cases. Yeah, so speaking of, I, I think you're talking about two key points that have come up in the budget deficit. Um, yeah, so there, those are additional costs, and unfortunately what happened was that previous administration um, put out a budget that uh, cut those areas and essentially under budgeted those areas without an actually an actual plan to control the cost in those areas um, but just to pass a budget that was balanced on paper but in actuality there was no plan to reduce the cost of special education or charter school and in and or health benefits and in fact we couldn't not with the tuition, the amount of enrollment, and the student population that we know that we have. So that's been discussed multiple times, unfortunately. Um, I do not believe that those things were taken into consideration last year. We knew that there was going to be a spike in the charter school tuition. We underestimated the enrollment. We didn't take into the account the increase in the tuition. Um, and obviously, we're owning that. We have to, we're paying for that now, unfortunately. Does that answer some of your question, Ms. Cunningham? Yes, but you all voted on it, right? Well, actually, in the 20, that was the 2018-2019 budget. I did not vote on that, and neither did Commissioner Shepard, just on the record. So, yeah. Oh, I'll go like this down the, I'll, I'll start here, and then I'll here. Hi, um, Joe Simpson, Rock Acts. Yes. Um, how does the uh, tuition paid to charter schools and all the expenses per pupil compare to the uh, per pupil expense in the RCSD? Ooh, I know that's, that's hard to. Yeah, I think that's a hard question to like formulate because, yeah. So if there's a question that's asked, I just want folks to know, if there's a question that's asked that we cannot answer, we are putting all of the questions, they're gonna be typed up and the answer is on our website and we'll make sure it's on our social media. But that is a great question. I think it's a hard question to ask because the cost per pupil, if there's multiple language learners, special education, there are additional costs for different student populations and depending on how they're spread out. Um, but we can certainly look at an average Um, I, we were talking about um, budgeting in charters and the increase in charter school enrollment. Have we done that this year for years coming? Because in reality, having been in the district 25 years, um, I think the real issue is how do you get parents like me who are looking for schools in the district and cannot find something that adequately will educate our children. How do you keep us in the district without having to look at charters or private or any other school? Because the reality of it is, I'm a, I'm a grandparent right now with two grandchildren and I am struggling to find a middle school in the district. And I'm, I believe in public education. I grew up in public education. All my kids have graduated from the district. But right now, today, I, don't, I can't find a middle school. So how do you keep me in the district 
um, and, how, and, and how much have you planned for this crisis that we have as parents and as a district? We, we know that we are struggling with having decent schools, so how do we keep parents engaged in the district we can't possibly think that we can ask parents to overlook the fact that your child may not be educated. So how do we, how are we planning to fix that problem so that when we talk about the district and district schools, it's a viable option for parents? So first, let me Numbers just say. Numbers wise, yeah. I mean, because the money well, is where it is. Yeah, the money's where it is, but the question that you're asking, I don't think it relates to the budget portion of it, but we'll take the question. But it does. You're asking, well, well could, you're asking. The question is, let me, give me, give me, give me a budget question. question. Give me a budget question. How we're going to keep families budgeted, engaged. Go ahead. Have you budgeted for, for the possibility, the reality that parents don't have viable choices and that number, that, that, that number may not be as high as you would like it to be year after year for how many years? How are you going to fix that in this budget? Yeah, so and I think that's a come. trend data that you would budget off of for charter schools. And there is a, a data, there's a trend in the data for charter schools. So absolutely, we should have budgeted even in 2018, 19 for the trend that we knew that the data was there. And I'll let Bob add to that. But your other portion is how do we keep our families in the district and wanting to stay in the district and what options that they have? I will take those questions and I will pass them along to the superintendent, but in terms of, as it relates to the budget, But it is a budget portion. question, because if you don't have the money to come up with programming, those programmings won't exist. It has to be something that's in the budget first. You can't tell me you're gonna change the education system and you haven't budgeted to do that. It's just like, I'm not gonna buy new summer clothes if I don't have a budget for it. I can talk about it, but until I put that in my budget and make room for that in my budget, it's not going to happen. So my question is, where is it in the budget that we're making plans to change the current situation? Because we know our schools are failing, so where's the money to fix that problem? Because if that money is not budgeted, it's not going to happen. We're going to do this 10 more years, yeah. and we're not going to have schools that are going to work for our kids. You, that's a great point. That is a, a very valid point, and we got burned this year, <laughs> as you know. Um, for the current school year, our budget for charter school tuition was too low. And when the enrollment trends and the actual rates are uh, finalized, um, the district got squeezed financially because we have to make those payments. We can't say, um, sorry, we ran out of appropriations, we, we can't pay anymore. No, we have to. So to your point, where does the money come from to make those required payments? It comes from the other programming areas. So as we are required to make charter school tuition payments, the students in our districts kind of might bear that burden educationally. So, so you're right. So what we have to do going forward is be a lot more judicious in our uh, enrollment projections, our cost projections, so that we can budget appropriately, even conservatively, to make sure that we don't feel that pinch in a future year. So we're gonna, we are doing that. Um, I did, I think I mentioned a few minutes ago, I actually looked at the enrollment trends for the past several years, and I can see on average a 6.6% increase. So we have to take that into account going into the 2020-21 budget season, right? So we're gonna do that. That's gonna cause some pressure. You know, charter school tuition payments are approaching $100 million. That's like about a ninth of our budget, so, you know, 10, 11%. You know, we have like, almost a $950 million budget, right? So 11% is taken up by charter school tuition. And we still have to manage those payments. Uh, we have to have someone in the district actually processing those payments. So this is gonna be a tough issue, right? This is gonna be tough going into to next year because we have to have the um, appropriate amount of appropriations. Hold on, can we get her mic? Because again, we're recording and we want the audience to be able to hear you at home, but also it'll be on video. So, 
So do we have funds that are actually going to be allotted for improving as well as, we know well, we have to make the payment, but do we have dollars set aside to say, well, this school needs these additional dollars to get to this place so it's a viable school for our kids? Do we have dollars set aside for improvement of existing schools that are, you know, might be on the border? Yeah. So not yet because it's part of the budget development, but I do want to remind folks that we would love to support all of our schools and fund them the way they should be funded, which is part of the argument that New York State owes the school <laughs> district money and we're not able to provide those services because the state owes us money. And on top of that, we have a deficit. So I just want to point that out that I would, if you want to join the fight, there are lots of folks here who have been going to Albany to fight that fight, but if the state actually gave us our foundation aid, then we would be able to provide all of our schools the adequate supports and funding for every school that we could. But unfortunately, that's not our reality right now. And I know that the board just started discussing to finalize board prior priorities, because what this forces us to do is really as a board figure out what will we stand for? And I can tell you, um, you know, restorative practices, there's been a lot of energy and money and time spent over the years in this district on restorative practices across our district. We can't afford to lose restorative practices, not just financially, but the benefits that it has on our students. So it is a difficult year. What I would ask of you to do is to please right to Albany, put the pressure on state legislators and Governor Cuomo to give us our funding. Thank you, that leads right into my question. My name is Gail Harrison, I'm representing uh, Baber AME uh, Social Justice Commission. My question is this to the CFO, if the district had been getting its foundation aid over the past years, would it be in this position now? And, or, is the problem larger than that? Well, the budget, the budget issue has several facets to it, right? Obviously, if New York State had been um, appropriating in its budget, the, the um, can I call it the correct amount of foundation aid that they uh, promised, that would have been a tremendous benefit to district finances. However, another side of that coin is how do we, when we get revenue from New York State, how do we allocate it? And how do we monitor the spending, right? So if we had received the additional foundation aid that we were promised years ago, would we be in the state we are now? Probably not, um, but it's hard to say what's the impact of something that didn't happen. Um, so it's really incumbent upon us to be good fiscal stewards of the revenues we do receive and make sure that they're allocated appropriately and monitored. Well, that's a question about being a fiscal steward. My, my real question is when you look at the deficit and then you look at what's owed, is there a balance there? Or is there still a negative balance? Or is there, or does it plateau? So you're in a position now to say, okay, we're missing $60 million. We should have been getting 30 million, 30 million, 30, or whatever it is over the past 10 years. And now we're at $86 million. When you look at that across the years, and then you look at the deficit and just subtract, what do you find? Yeah, so if you wanna do more simple math like that, look at yes. our deficit today. Yes. And would that have been wiped out if the governor were to plop a check on our well, desk? Well, if he had and followed, um, you know, the court rule. Yeah, it, it would have, it would more than eradicate our deficit. Yeah. More. So the state the, owes a lot of money. Yeah, so the, so the fight, so in order for our district to have the programs that we need so parents aren't fleeing, I have three grandchildren in the, in the district. I'm concerned about, um, you know, what's happening. We, wanted, we don't want our children to be guinea pigs. And so when this fight comes up and we're talking about foundation aid that the district is owed, I mean, that's a real fight. That's at Sioux level, <laughs> Sue S-U-E, <laughs> you know. That's the level. That's not to say what the reality is or what the, you know, what blah, blah, blah. That's to say, to me, where our fight is. Because at this point, our children are getting 
dissed. <laughs> Our children are not getting what they're owed. We are a district that requires and needs certain things. And if we don't have them, then you see this. And then within the board and within the CFO office, then you can talk about waste or whatever. But get the money that you're supposed to have. Get it. My, qu <laughs> My question follows directly. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. My question follows directly on top of that. My question is why our district leadership whether it's in the budget office, board members, why are we using neutral technocratic language? Why are we equivocating, almost being almost embarrassed, it sounded like, to say like what we are owed by the state? This is statute. This is, there's statutory limitations. The school board was just given guidance yesterday in email about the complexities of state aid financing so that school board members can be well informed and articulate. And it, it goes right through if statute, if statute was followed, the formulas and the amount would be so different. And I just want to say the reason why this question is urgent, I mean, I can't, I can't say it as well as you did, but I want to just add to the evidence following up on the question about programs and improvement. We've seen improvement driven by budget allocations to restorative practices, toward anti-racism work, toward you know, focusing in on schools. And then we've also seen where the state has directed extra funds to East High School, to School 45, to School 9, schools where we've seen dramatic increases in achievement where the board has been celebrating their achievements that's because they were given extra funding under state stipulated receivership laws which are problematic if they just fully funded the foundation aid and allowed our community groups like we did with school climate work to drive that progress if we allowed teachers and parents to work together and drive that progress we would be seeing the kinds of fruits that we're beginning to see at places like east high school and so it's so easy. It's like, it's not complicated. It is about power and wealth and about the opposition to that. There's a petition going around. Sorry, I'm, this, I'm just gonna say real quick. There's a petition going around. It's um, my daughters who led some of the um, walkouts over you know, when the midterm, mid-year cuts were being done. This is their latest effort to advocate because there's a bill that targets people who make over $100 million for a very small increase in their tax percentage, and it would fully fund foundation aid. And it's such a beautiful circle because um, Senator Robert Jackson was one of the original parent plaintiffs on campaign for fiscal equity. He became a school board member, a city council member in Harlem. Now he is a state senator leading this equity fight decades later. Our kids got an opportunity to spend time with him and to learn from him. And what are we doing in Rochester? Why are we not? I mean, we are the epicenter. Did you see that, that equity, um, the border, the, the most segregating border in the nation is Penfield and Rochester? What are we doing? Why are we not fighting harder? It, you know, it's more than a petition. It's like we should be breaking down Albany's doors and, and allying with the senators who, there's powerful advocates and allies right now. And I feel like we're not even strongly aligning with them. Like, why are we letting New York City progressive leaders fight for us without us pulling our weight? Sorry, it wasn't a question. <laughs> That's okay, it'll go on public record, Mary, and then everyone can see it and live as well. So good commentary. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Kelly and um, I have a niece who graduated from RCSD and her daughter is about to um, enter kindergarten in short order. And so I'm very concerned about what is happening with the district and have been for years. Now I will tell you in full disclosure, I work at a charter school and I have worked in charter school since 2007. And it's not because I do not wish to help out in the district or work in the district. It's just where I got my first job and that's where I've stayed because I'm about educating our kids period, wherever that has to happen, whether it's an RCSD, charter school, um, private schools, suburban schools, wherever. I just want to see our kids get a good education. Now, my question is, and maybe this is just naive, but why, how long have you not received the state aid, uh, foundation aid from the state? And what are the plans of the board to get that money, because that, that's a good start um, to help fix this problem. There are other things we need to talk about, but the reality is right now we need some money, and we, and we need to get it from the state. So what is the plan to get this foundation aid that the district is owed? 
Yeah, so let me again reiterate, like, as the chair of finance, my focus is on, unfortunately, this budget because this is a really rough budget and the reality is we have a very large deficit to figure out to close. I know that there are board members who have gone to Albany, um, have called, have met with our elected officials in Albany, state legislators, have written to Governor Cuomo, and have been pushing, and there are previous board members who went to Albany and fought and asked for funding. Um, and there are board members who've been on the board for a number of years who go every year to Albany to ask for the foundation aid. Um, and it's not just us either. There is a lawsuit right now in New York City um, that I saw for them also trying to push for their foundation aid as well. Long Island, every, every couple of years, Long Island has this deficit that also appears on their budget. Um, so in terms of the board as a plan, um, they have been pushing. We do have a new chair for the community and government relations, and that's gonna be part of the legislative breakfast. Is that on the agenda, Ms. Adams? For the, yeah. So that's gonna be on, we host a legislative breakfast with elected officials, so that's on the agenda this year as well. Um, but that's all I can really speak to on that. Sorry, okay. I'll, I'll just say this then, again, I work at a charter school, I love what we do, but I also think this is an opportunity for all of us to come together because this affects everybody. And so, and I think part of the problem is we've separated every, everything so segregated that if we don't get it together and come together as one community, it affects our kids. And I'm a city resident, I love living in this city, and I'm I'm very concerned about what is happening. As a charter school person, it's hard for me to understand how that was under budgeted because you can go even get their state reports and get their enrollment projections and current enrollment. And so the, these are just things that I think, some of our problem is we're not talking. We're just not talking to each other and we're not talking to the right people. And I'm just gonna advocate that we continue to do that. And so I'm grateful for opportunities like this that the community can come to and speak on, and I'm hoping that we can come together and really solve this problem because it is an issue and I wanna see my niece get a good education. I don't wanna have to move out of the city to make that happen. I don't wanna have to move out of this city to make that happen. I don't think I should. So we gotta start coming together. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, Don Powell. Uh, just to kind of piggyback off this talk about the state contribution, I kind of want to talk about the city's contribution, which I understand has not changed one penny in the last 10 years. 14. While my taxes keep going up. 14 years. And, the yeah, and, and the costs in the district keep going up, you know, healthcare especially. So what are we doing to engage the city uh, to start ponying up more, more funding for the city school district? So thank you for bringing that up because you constantly actually will hear people in the city talk about the miraculous $119 million that they give us every year. So yes, if you own housing in the city of Rochester, your education tax has increased. It's going to continue to increase. We do not see that increase. And I did the calculations on Evan Dawson's show with inflation, if we were getting the, even minimum leave, we were getting 14% of what was collected from the education tax and properties, we would be at $183 million that the city would have to provide for us. So there is an inflation rate there if we were appropriately um, given the funding. Um, I, I, that's a bigger, tougher, um, I would love to fight for it. I know Commissioner Powell, this is one thing we do strongly both agree on. We're like, we should take the city on and take them to court and fight them for our uh, uh, full amount that they owe us. I also want to point out, and we will have this in the budget book, and we're going to have a takeaway, um, that we get $119 million, but we are also then charged for things through the city of Rochester. That's almost equivalent to 119 million. And we're gonna break down that number through the budget process because I want people in this community to understand that we get 119 million, but we're responsible for paying for SROs and their full, full entirety. That's a couple of million of do dollars right there. We have to pay for the rec centers that our schools are a part of. So not only do we pay rent, we also have to pay the RG&E more than 60%, even though we're not in the property or the building more than 60% of the time. So the city does charge back 
for services that are city related right back to the district. And that 119 million really dwindles down to a very small percentage of the 119 million. So we will have that as a, as a chart so that this community can understand exactly how that 119 million that we get from the city is charged. Um, that's something I know that Commissioner Powell did a white paper on for us to study and explore. There have been previous lawsuits from different members of this community around that. Certainly this is a time to re-explore that again. Um, school resource officers, so police officers in school, but we pay the entire cost of that under the, the 119, or the city budget, the Rochester City School District budget. Um, here and then, oh, here and then over here. So Stevie and then Vicki. Yes, um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, I, it's not a question, it's more of a statement since I hear a lot about foundation aid and that's exactly what we're working on and I hear a lot Good. of questions about what can we do and how can we fight for the foundation aid? And who's gonna fight for that foundation aid? And it's us, it's the parents, it's the teachers, it's the students. We can yell at the school board for stuff that the state has done to us all day, but it, get us, it gets us nowhere. We have gone to Albany, Citizen Action has bought buses, and we bus people out all the way down there. And we do letter writing campaigns, we do phone banking. Mary Adams, her daughters, and other students, we drove six hours all the way to Yonkers to speak at the Westchester uh, budget delegation and drove just to speak for two minutes each and then drove all the way back on a weekday. It was a school night. Not everyone can make that sacrifice, but there's other things that you can do. We have weekly, daily action items where we target senators to get them on board to support a revenue bill that can tax the ultra rich that would more than fund the foundation aid. The one that uh, Mary was referencing, it raises the tax on them by 11.98%. It's still not the highest tax rate in the nation. And it's on the ultra wealthy. It would generate $4 billion a year. So it's more than enough to foundation aid. And it's picking up steam in the Senate. The Assembly just passed, uh, just sponsored their own version of the bill. But in order for those things to move and get traction, we have to mobilize as parents, as students, as teachers, as concerned community members. Because if we are not vocal about what we want to see in our community, they will continue to ignore us. So the one thing that I've seen come out of this crisis is that we have all united in the common goal to get the funding that's owed to us. The state owes us $86.1 million. There's nothing equitable about that. It's shock doctrine. This is done on purpose to force us into a position, to force us into a crisis where we are forced to accept scraps that puts us further in a hole and to privatize our schools. I heard a lot about charter schools. My baby sister goes to a charter school. We will never blame teachers for teaching in a charter school. We will never blame parents for putting their children in a charter school. We will never blame anyone for doing what's best for their kids. But the situation is not equitable in any way between charter schools and our city schools. And I'll just point out one little fact. The funding provided by the city of Rochester to the RCSD has remained flat for 15 years. While the amount the RCSD has to pay from its budget to charter schools has increased by 1,194%. That's, that's not an accident. So it's unfortunate that it takes a crisis to wake everyone up to what's happening, but the only way we are going to get the funding from the state is if we all mobilize. So if you want action items on what we can do, who the targets are, I'll still be here. I'll give you all the information you need. Thank you, Stevie. Um, hold on, uh, Vicki had her hand up first, I'm sorry, and then. Yes, yeah, she Oh, okay. So then I'll give it. Okay. Um, hi, I have hi. Um, two questions. Um, the first question is related, oh, I'm Laura Smith. Hi, Laura. <laughs> I live in Rochester um, and my daughter will be three soon. So she's just about to start her journey in school. And um, my question relates to transportation. 
I, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't fully follow where our data on transportation costs exactly is reflected in the budget document. Central. Do you have the section number? Because it's in central. Back of section four. Back of section four, okay. Because um, one thing that I had noted um, is that uh, our school district spends a um, vastly increased proportion of its budget on transport as compared to all of the surrounding areas. Um, and one thing that I was thinking was that it absolutely is egregiously disgusting that we aren't receiving the funding that we should that is set out. I, I absolutely agree with that. But are we sure that we have done everything that we could to be in inventive to make changes in how our budget is distributed to maximize what we're getting from that, the current money that we receive? And one area I thought we could have some questions about would be transportation. So let me just first say like the data that um, to compare the Rochester City School District's transportation costs to surrounding areas. Um, the suburban schools have l less, a lot less schools than we do. We have um, 64 programs in schools. We're, zone, we're in four different zones, even though we label it three zones. The city is laid out in Southwest, Northwest, Northeast. We also have a school choice policy, which, um, has a lot of challenges and it is something that the superintendent is looking at because we can have a student that lives in the northwest zone but they're placed in the southeast and we have to provide transportation um, in addition to that the the um, we have that we also have an inequitable amount of how our ELL and special education students are distributed among our schools. And that's something that we're looking at right now as well. So if there's only certain schools in certain areas that accept special education or a 1211 or four, or um, you know, a smaller class size is an 811, um, or they only have capacity for some ELLs in only certain schools, that's also going to drive the cost. We're also a very transient community, um, which is another underlying issue overall in this entire community with, that's related to poverty. We have a lot of families that move, unfortunately, for whatever reasons. It could be from this month to the next, and I work in this community, I see it. There are lots of reasons why families are often in those situations. But all of those things have a, play a factor into our cost for transportation. But on our end, we certainly will be looking at distributing our special education populations and our English language learners equitably across the entire district. And also, um, the superintendent has been charged to bring us some options around the school choice policy. So it's certainly something he's looking at. Commissioner Powell, yes. Yes. Just to add a little bit to what was already said, and I think everything said so far, I think everything that was said so far is correct, but let me add a little bit more depth to that. The, the closest district to us in terms of transportation is Buffalo. Why? Because they have even more charter schools than we do, and we own, all, all districts that have charter schools within them own the responsibility of busing the kids to those charter schools. They also have a, um, a school choice model similar to ours. Big difference though, Buffalo in terms of sheer square miles is smaller and more compact than we are. So even if you compare Rochester to Buffalo, it's reasonable to expect our cost to be more because we're transporting more square miles, okay? Uh, if you were to compare us to East Rochester, Every single child in East Rochester is walking distance to the school. Okay, I don't even think they own a school bus. So there are a lot of our neighbors that it's not an appropriate comparison. Our, our suburban neighbors have no charter schools except for Greece. Okay, so they just don't bear the same cost. So, you know, uh, we did talk a little bit about school choice needs to be tightened up. There is room to rein in costs by um, changing how we do um, school choice. But here's the important thing I want you to walk away with. If we s stop offering families choice within our district, 
you know they're going to make the choices outside the district. They're going to choose charter schools if we don't offer families choice within our portfolio of schools. So that doesn't, that doesn't fix the transportation problem, right? That just shifts who the child goes to and instead of paying our teachers, we're going to pay charter school tuition instead. So there's a lot that has to go into that conversation, okay? Thank you, that's very helpful. And the second part of my question was, I don't want to appear pessimistic. Um, I really value and appreciate all the lobbying and discussions that have gone on to try to change the situation of funding from the city and also funding from the state. But I'm alarmed that that has continued for a long, long time. And I can't feel entirely optimistic that that's going to change overnight. So my, my question is really, do we have some plan Bs on innovative ways that we as a city can generate um, income to our school systems at, from the wealthy suburbs that plenty of people are willing to provide maybe some funding or more generally externally through business or uh, organizations? Do we have anything that we can do with that? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's illegal. She said it's illegal. It is illegal. Um, I'm trying to figure out, like, um, I, and, and I have to say, um, not that I don't want our business communities to support our schools. I do, and, and I think they do in different ways. I caution the support with strings attached. And so there are, our, our business community does support individual schools, but then to consider them to fund the entire, I, I just... One, I, for me personally, this is just me personally speaking, not on behalf of the district, and Bob can speak to some of this. I would just be cautious about that and what strings would be attached with it. Um, we are part of the, the big fives, and so as the suburban school districts, you know, um, their budget is voted on by their community, but it is heavily tied to their tax levy. And if they have an increase in their budget, um, the community has to agree to have that increase in their taxes. We are not a part of that process. We have a different process because we're part of the big five. So the board votes for the budget, the city council votes for the budget, and then we are stuck with what we get. Um, so, I don't know any other innovative way than to really, at this point, for me, my goal is to, and I think this is our CFO's goal, is to budget within our means right now while we're still pushing and fighting. I think this fight has like had its peaks and then people kind of forget about it, and it's had its peaks and then people kind of forget about it because a balanced budget was passed. Um, but the fact that we have a deficit is gonna be really felt and it's already being felt. And so I think that it can't go unnoticed at this point and we cannot rest on a balanced budget anymore. The budget can be balanced, but we're still going to suffer from major deficits of supports and resources for our students. Um, so the, my hope and goal is that it keeps the fight alive. Um, and politics right now is a very strange place. There's a lot of weird things happening all across the country. Um, but I do know that we are going to feel the, the pain of this year's budget and this year's deficit. We already starting to feel that pain. And I don't think that that's gonna get any better because that charter school trend is still a trend that's increasing. And so there are lots of layers to that. How do we figure out how to keep our students enrolled, right? If we don't have the funding to offer them the programs that they may want or the magnet schools or attractions. So I think this is gonna be an ongoing conversation that this community can no longer just rest on a balanced budget. I appreciate everything you said, thank you. I, I, I should clarify, I wasn't meaning for us to take money from the other school districts. What I was thinking more is the model of uh, crowdsourcing financing. So in terms of us looking at, for example, a program that we could set up where people could sponsor a child's transportation, um, where we would reach out to, to different people around the nation, why not? to help fund our district to carry out those basic things like f providing food and all those kind of things that we could maybe get some support with. 
<laughs> um, we were just talking, having a sidebar, because a lot of the schools, actually, their PTOs, PTAs, and school-based planning teams kind of set up accounts to do fundraising for smaller, smaller scale. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I would love to actually have that question written out and okay. pass it through administration, but also legal, because okay. my gut tells me there might be some legal things involved in it. I'm not 100% sure on that. I would love to do it, um, but I don't know how much we could crowd fund and raise and um, certainly like I said we'll take the question we'll make sure it goes on the website and then get an answer from both administration and legal thank you sorry I didn't have an answer <laughs> Vicki okay um, my name is Vicki Robertson I'm a parent in the district my son graduated last year and I've got my younger one is a sophomore at Wilson so I've been doing this for a while um, and I've looked at an awful lot of budgets, so I'm going to switch the conversation. I'm 100% behind Stevie and the push for foundation aid. We've got to make it happen, um, but we've also got to deal with this budget. And my question really to the CFO is, how understandable and transparent is this budget going to be? Because I've looked at, I've had CFOs tell me, oh, well, you can't really look at this individual school data. That's just all up in flux, and it changes all year round. So don't worry your pretty little head. All right, they didn't exactly say that. Um, <laughs> um, to having real credible information where I could say, oh, we've caught two art teachers and a science, you know, and a science teacher or whatever, and then I can s understand the choice. Um, there's going to be really tough choices that you have to make and I want to understand what they are and be able to tell you whether I think they're a good or bad choice um, and I think that's really important um, it's the only way we're going to get through this is if we all understand the logic we may not all agree with the logic but we need to really have um, in-depth understanding of that logic and transparent understanding of that logic if it's just surprise when you show up at school and there's no teacher for your kid or your kids in a class of 30 kids or whatever um, that's not okay uh, we, we need to understand what's going on and how are you gonna be able to do that because honestly definitely over the last couple of years I, I gave up trying to read the budget book because it was it just was meaningless so a couple things about that. Um, regarding transparency in the budget book, it's, and I said this about other budgets that I've put together, it's 600 pages of transparency. It is so transparent you don't even read it sometimes, right? It's just too thick. Um, we try to cram a lot of data into this document. Um, including student performance data, school performance data, which isn't really a dollar earned or a dollar spent, but it kind of goes to the outcome you get for the dollar you spent. Um, our <laughs> the budget director and I have had a couple of conversations about this. Um, I'm not going to make an excuse here, but I'm going to make an excuse here. Um, being the new guy and our budget director is this first year that he's actually the director, we're making as few changes as possible to the budget book, but we know there are changes to be made. Um, our other problem is we had a $64 million deficit this fiscal year. Everything kind of got put on hold. We would have started the budget process back in November. That all got pushed to the side, so we really started in mid-January. Um, really compressing the timeline and making it almost impossible to make meaningful change to the the actual document that is a budget book. Um, but we but we get that concern. I, I would love to comment though. Our superintendent. What I what I love about Superintendent Dave is he tends to put his cards on the table. So when you want transparency, every time he gets up in front of the board, every time he gets in front of uh, a state senator or assembly member or the media he tends to put his cards on the table and he's probably one of the more honest speaking uh, individuals I've, I've had the pleasure of working with. I know you wanted to tag. 
I, no, I want to add to this because we are actually going to have a supplemental document to the budget that's going to talk about what's being cut, what the impact's going to be. Um, because I had the same concerns, like if the cuts are going to be throughout six, seven hundred pages, how can anybody really go through it and have any meaningful understanding to what that means for their child or their school and so forth. So we will have a supplemental document. We created the trifold just so it has, can I borrow yours, Kathy? So we created this trifold um, specifically for this one because it has all the important key dates and we want folks to remember these dates. But if you look in here, um, there's some important district overview about our charter enrollment and our enrollment and so forth um, and w which section each in the budget. But we're going to create something a little bit bigger than this because this is I'm, I'm getting old and this is really hard for me to even read. <laughs> even with these glasses, so it'll be a little bit bigger, but there will be a takeaway supplemental, um, sort of like a guide to the budget to like, hey, here are the cuts in this section, you're gonna be able to see what the superintendent is proposing, where the cuts are gonna be made, and then what page in the budget book to reference it to. So that's something that's going through the, through the subcommittee for the finance, we're working on it, Vicki. Um, I'll go to Amen and then I'll go to you, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I have some specific questions, and you can answer them now if possible. So uh, will you present on March 17th a balanced budget so that the community can get a sense of what you're actually going to cut? Because I know in past years, an unbalanced budget is presented, and then it all gets figured out at the end. And that also creates issues of transparency, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's not real for people if it's not in there. So first part, you know, will there be a balanced budget on March 17th? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And can I also just add that part of the process that for the board undertaking was talking about board priorities first. Because yes, in the past there's an unbalanced budget and then we do the song and dance to the administration where we ask them questions, they may answer, we may like the answer, we may not like the answer, and then we give them the priorities like, two weeks before the budget is supposed to be balanced and due, and then if there are cuts that are taken away from here, there has to be cuts over here, and then there's no real understanding of like the trickle-down effect of all that. So this year, um, we just met on Tuesday and to start the process of creating and drafting the board priorities as a guide to the superintendent. These are the areas we absolutely will not support, and these are the areas that we will support. Um, and that's gonna be important for him, him and his team and Bob to know, so don't come to us with cuts and restorative practices, because the board, you're not gonna get four votes to support that budget. So that was part of the goal, was to get that out there and be transparent as a board to the administration, so that they know of kind of a guide of how to figure this out. So yeah, and I know Bob's goal is to present a balanced budget that's gonna be accurate from the very beginning to the very end. And, and a, a second piece is, will you provide, because it's not usually provided, a position summary of all the positions that are being cut? Because you can't really see in the budget book what's happening, because it's all disappears into each individual school's budget or in different administrative units. So uh, it, maybe it's not part of the budget document, but I think a real breakdown of what are the cuts gonna be, so you know that it's not half a social worker here, half one there, but it's 10 total, or yeah. that it's 15 reading teachers, that you have those hard numbers. And then also a breakdown of what are the positions being cut that are actually filled versus positions that are just held in the budget and never filled. Because I know another real problem for the community is that there are a lot of positions yeah. in the budget that simply are never filled. And so that's an equity issue and, and a transparency issue. Yeah, so we are going to, in the supplemental document, show what, where, where the cuts are being made and what the actual impact of those cuts are. Again, as a parent, I would wanna know, if, is, is someone being cut in my child's school, how is that gonna impact me and my child? Um, and so that's kind of like the um, mentality for me going into helping work with them on the development of that, is that if, I'm a parent at 15, I want to know is 15 going to be impacted? Who at 15 will potentially, is it going to be the art teacher, the music teacher? I need to know so that I can then also support my child. Because I know we have these conversations as adults, but our children really are really the ones who are facing this stuff day to day. They're like the front line 
of all of these conversations. Um, so part of the supplemental document is really to show, like, here are all the cuts, here's the areas that they're gonna be cut. Um, certainly we could do it by FTE, ver an actual FTE. And I do think that that's something, so Bob and I have had meetings too, and like he said, he's brand new and like we're in the middle of a crisis. Um, so again, like next year, the vision even for this is that we do this in each school, in each school community, and that we also then have the, um, instead of doing the two-way conversation on March 25th at central office, that that is also moved from school to school to school. Um, and so that's gonna take a while <laughs> to plan, and, but I do think it's doable. Again, there are seven board members. It does not just have to be me. We, we have school liaisons. Um, so I share that to say that yes, in the supplemental packet, um, we did create a feedback too for tonight. Um, so certainly if there's additional feedback on how to improve these things, we want to, I want to personally hear that. Let me just say that I am a big fan of assessments and using assessments to better improve these type of forums and outcomes and so forth. Um, so that'll be on the district's website and if folks want to email to them, let me know and I will make sure it gets emailed to you too. But yes, Eamon, we are going to have here where the cuts all are here. And I think that's important. And then also where in the budget book to reference it. So if people want to read further into it in the budget book um, and where that's going to be. So Bob's looking at me because he's not there yet, but me and Kylie have had these conversations. <laughs> um, I have a, another question. Yes. We were talking about, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to take us back, but I think it's important when we were talking about the city and the city's contribution. I, um, the reality is we are impoverished. And a lot of our property in the city, there's no taxes to get. It's city owned. And so my question is, is when we're talking about dollars, are we looking at ways to sit down with the city and those um, key players to talk about ways that all of the, the entities, city, city, city school district, um, whatever agencies that are directly affecting our ability to move forward as a community as it relates to our children's education, are we planning, do we have something that is going to make sure that that happens so that when the city makes a decision, it doesn't hurt us in a way that we're paying, I'm gonna say this, we paying for cops, we really don't need cops, we can do rent of cops. I mean, I'm looking at my kids, and I'm like, you don't you need to arrest. Because you because you, what I'm you need to talk to your mayor. That's what I will say. I, 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 I am. Have that conversation. I, I don't, you know me. Now, you know me. I know. I, I have a, have I have a, it was interesting for me to hear that our, their, their contribution has not increased with all of the desire for uh, mayoral control and these of the, that sort. Bottom line for me, if that's what you believe, then you put your money where your mouth is regardless of whether you agree with the situation or not, because at the end of the day, our children, the people that you're fighting for, are not being educated. And you can't tell me that you're fighting for them if you ain't putting no money in this. See, so I don't have a problem going to her, but I want to know what we're doing to make sure they come to the table to talk about these things, because it disturbs me that if we got to give them back the money that they give us, Another we need way. to fire them. And get and, and get some more money. Get, keep our money. I'm with Just you on this Just give me our money. One. Let us do what we got to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm being real because. No, me too. I want you to know I support that I'm, ideology. I'm, I'm, but Because if the reality of it is, at the end of the day, my expectation is my grandchildren, just like my children, will have an education that they can stand on when they go to to college. I do not expect them to have to take remedial courses when they go to college because they did not get an adequate high school education. And the reality of it is, I'm, let me be transparent, this is my first year working in a charter school. And I went to the charter schools because I knew that, yes, we have, Rochester Prep is the bomb. But other than that, Charter schools have the same issue we have in the district. Our children are not black children, colored children are not being educated. And it was my way 
of going in and providing a service because I want every child in that charter school to be successful. I'm just one person and my plan is to affect every, all 320 of those kids because I'm fighting the same battle at their table that I'm fighting at this table because that's the only way the change is gonna come to them. I'm not really interested in high up, I'm, I'm interested in them because they don't understand budgets. They don't, they don't understand anything other than I go in a classroom and my computer doesn't work and there's not enough for me and we don't have pencils and we come to school late. The bus is an hour and a half late. They didn't call us. We don't have adequate food. The food is nasty. They don't want to eat it. That's what our children understand. We don't get to do what they get to do. We don't go on field trips. I'm at the place now where I, you know, all this is great, but I wanted to go all the way down to that three-year-old that's getting on that bus. When they walk on, I want them to have the best experience every single day, every single time they touch any school in our district. And then for that to happen, we need to get people at the table talking. No exceptions to that rule. So my question is, it's a budget crisis and the city is taking yeah. back their money. What are we doing to make sure they give it back to us? Well, let me just also say that not only um, that, I think that's something you need to have a conversation with the mayor about. Um, and in addition, while there were families and um, students from Rochester going down to Albany to talk to legislators and fight for foundation aid, our mayor was actually asking to have the legislators reduce the $119 million and said that she lost um, 7,000 students, that our district was, we lost 7,000 students to charter schools. Um, and in reality, it was a little over the six. However, um, they are still city of Rochester residents. <laughs> um, we are still responsible for the tuition, the transportation, and so that number was an inaccurate reflection. But this is what the mayor was doing which was counterproductive to our families and our students going to Albany. Um, Commissioner Powell, let me just take a few more families. And okay. Okay. Um, real quick, um, I, when you're talking about um, the, the 119 million, you said and, and property values are going down. We, we are a poor city, but property taxes, I'm sorry, property assessment has risen Six hundred million dollars over the period of time when our aid was held flat. So what the city is doing is going backwards and saying, "Oh well, we'll reduce the rate, the tax rate, for for school purposes, in order that in the end it still adds up to 119 million." At the same time, they're reducing their own rate, the the, the municipal part, but not by as much and they're reducing the non-homestead, that's commercial property, by significant amounts. So, um, just want you to know, it, uh, from, from property value standpoint, the city is, is capable of generating more revenue, not less. Hi, my name is Carol Elizabeth Owens, and I'm here with the Minority Reporter Media Group. And our readers, I think, would be interested in knowing what is the total cost of education per student, and of that number, what percentage of that is dedicated to administrative cost? Ooh, the cost per pupil. Again, the cost per pupil, um, there are different factors for each cost per pupil. So a special education student is going to cost more to educate because of, and it's all gonna be dependent on the IEP and the services that they need. So there's an average for a special education student we know on average it's between 11 and 13 more, more than the base. Um, but for ELL students with different languages, home languages, there's also an additional cost. Um, Currently, per pupil, do you know the per pupil cost per student? And, and right not now? just, and to be clear, not just per pupil. And and I understand what you're saying. You know, different students who have different needs, the cost would vary with that. But also for each category of student, 
what is the percentage of the cost of education that is dedicated to administrative expenses related to educating that student? That's one question, and then I have another one after that. I I'll have to I'll take that one. We'll take that question in writing and answer it back in writing. Okay, and, and the next question I have is, um, to what extent do you think the fact that we're dealing with students who are primarily black and brown and um, of lower, generally speaking, socioeconomic status, to what extent do you think that is in the mix as we talk about the budget crisis and the inadequate funding of our schools in the district? 100 percent. A hundred percent. That's just my opinion. I just want to say, but it is. A, it feels like a hundred percent that it is. It, the inadequacies of funding primarily affects urban school districts. So I know that Rochester, we're primarily large black and brown students in our district. But when you look at urban school districts across the nation, they're also chronically underfunded. It doesn't even matter what state it's in. It's just, you say public urban education, and we're talking about schools that have large segments of black and brown kids. Those school districts are fundamentally underfunded, un they have less resources, less access to um, programs and services like tutoring, after school programs, extracurriculum activities. Um, I think this is a national epidemic um, and I think it's a national crisis. So uh, for us, we feel it here in Rochester, but you know, uh, my mom taught in the Newark School District. She saw it every single day. Philadelphia is the same way. Um, Chicago, uh, even Oregon. Let me just say this, there, are, there is an urban school district in Oregon and them too. Um, Denver, like you see this across places that you would not even think um, would be impacted in the same way, but they are. My name is Kathy Smith, and I was, um, I not only attended RCSC, but I taught in the city for over 20 years, and I recently retired, but I am a community member as well. Um, my biggest concern right now is once the budget is created and hopefully balanced, because we do have a history of under, um, what am I trying to say, under appropriating under, and yeah. overspending, where is gonna where is the oversight that's my concern where is the oversight so we have less of this trauma of this the the budget situation that we're in right now i know having worked in the city that there is a lot of waste there's a lot of waste and so where does that come from that's my first question will there be anything new in the budget to oversee the individual schools when once they have their budget are they overspending are they underspending what's happening so that's my first question okay do you want to answer that you want me to answer about the hard stops yeah they so so i'm going to answer and then bob can jump in um hard stops so essentially um we were operating under the previous administrator with very, very minimum hard stops on across the district. And so what does that mean? It's equivalent to you overdrafted in your checkings, and if you don't have it in your savings, you overdrafted, you may not get, you be, you'll be denied payment. We were just approving payments all across multiple lines and areas because we didn't have those hard stops in place. Now that was a function that in the past had been on, but for some reason was turned off. Um, and, and that's part of this. So I know that there were some overview, big areas where we under budgeted and overspent. And I just wanna say, I know that it's a nicer way to say it, but the reality is that we under budgeted in areas we had no business under budgeting in, and we automatically would have overspent because there were no hard stops, there was no plan to manage and control the expense. Yes, and you can't, right? Health insurance is a rising cross across the country for every organization. Um, it, it's a rising cost, health insurance. So we knew that the cost of health insurance was rising, and yet we cut in that area, even though we didn't cut employees, we didn't do anything to actually control that cost in a different way. Um, so I will say that Bob has already put in place some hard stops, um, and that's another function, and we're also exploring the, um, every month we get a, a fiscal, like a, a finance report on the board, um, and in August, we're going to be offering some trainings around how to read those reports, not just for the board, we're opening it up to everyone. Because 
that is where like the meat and potatoes are, but it's really dense and boring to read. And if you're not a numbers person, nobody wants to read it. So we've been having these conversations. Um, but I don't think that what happened before, given the fact that the deficit is so large and it came slapped us, everybody right in the face, that people are going to be relaxed about this budget or the budget process. Um, and uh, it, it was the, the wake up call that we didn't want, but we are all woken up now. Um, do you want to add anything else about anything else that's being done? I will. They should be in jail. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to ask too, though. Um, I guess one of my other concerns, or maybe suggestions, I guess more or less, um, we talk about our issues right now are multifaceted. I think we can all agree. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of moving parts to this, not just the budget, but you know the poverty. Everything is all included in that. But I guess. My question is, and my suggestion is, if we are paying for charter schools, well, it's my understanding we can pay for a child to be in charter, but then if they, for some reason, get sent back. They keep that money. They keep that money for that school year, and we get, we don't have to pay for them the following school year? Is that how that works? Yeah, we wouldn't, we, but they get to keep that money, so. Um, I think that's a difficult one because if a school, even that happens even within the district. So if we have a kid, let's say at 15, and they transfer schools to 58. 15 already took the money to budget in their budget because part of that helps allocate uh, the staffing, right? The enrollment helps to. And I'm not sure how you can ever plan yeah. for that. I guess. Yeah, you, you, it's tough because in a, at least within the district, when it's one school to one school, it's still within our school district and we have some control. We could probably say, hey, 15, send some money over this way because now we have the student and they have more needs than we originally anticipated for. And we're internal, we could potentially do it. With charters, it's like um, they, it's their money. They budgeted for it already. And I don't know if there's any way that we do tuition recoupment. Well, the other thing I guess my suggestion is, uh, some kind of going off of what was suggested over here, is like, so we're paying our bills, but we're not getting paid. That's, how I'm, that's what I'm hearing here. We're paying for charter schools, we're paying the city, but we're not getting paid. So maybe, as a single parent, you know, I know, if it's a choice between going to the movies or putting food on the table, let's put some food on the table and not pay our bills and maybe we'll open up some eyes of give us our money, we'll pay our bills. You're saying don't pay the charter tuition. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are bound by law, I just want you to. <laughs> we, well, the school board members are bound by law, I just want you to know, to do certain things whether we like it or not. Um, I will take that suggestion back to the superintendent and to legal and see what they say. Um, I don't think our, you know, um, I don't think they would be shy from certain lawsuits. Beatrice, this wasn't a, oh, this yes. wasn't part of my question, but since she said what she did, <laughs> is there a best practice that you follow concerning charter schools at the district? A best practice that you, uh, you know, adhere to and that you go by? So the charter schools. No, not no. So, so that's, you're just I, pulling things out of the fringe, and you just. Well, it's n we have no authority or control over charter schools. So. So there's uh, no to-do list. This is what. Not we for do. us. Not for the school board. And unfortunately, the other thing I want to add, though, that um, okay. and and this is a plug, and I know this is being recorded, but for this community to understand that when there is a new charter being proposed. We as the board have hearings for these charters for the community to come and express any concerns because we are obligated to at least document those concerns for the record and submit that to the state. Um, and in the last two years that I've been here, I think there's been like two or three hearings and even for their renewal. And I've never seen anybody show up. 
I may see a charter person show up just in case somebody shows up with a question, um, but sometimes they don't even show up because they know nobody in the community is going to show up. And I think if this community really wants to have this fight with charters or at least let the state know that we don't want any more charters, they're going to have to start showing up at these charter hearings and at the very minimum speaking out in droves and putting it on the record. Because right now what the state sees is that we have forums and people speak ill or speak against charters or so forth or whatever the case may be, but there's never anything on record documented as far as they're concerned because nobody shows up to these public hearings. But if it um, works, it's okay, but have a best practice. So we as parents, advocates, if we want to say, let me see the best practices for charter schools. Because if, if it's working, someone said the school they were at is the bomb. Yeah, uh, I would, I would parents, ask that you guys also advocate for transparency in the well, charter. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, I thank God for all of us in this room because we're advocates, we're the parents. But I want us to do something different tonight. Let us look at what we're going through with the lens of a child, okay? Let's switch our lens. Now, I've, I'm in a, a particular um, predicament, and I don't know what to do. I don't want to do what I normally do, so I came here to ask this question. Now, you're still going through budget cuts. You're still cutting teachers. Am I right? Well, we're going through. Uh, I, so the superintendent Part and his of the team, budget. yeah, they do that. I, as okay, a board member, right. I have no idea what they're going to okay, cut. Okay, so yet. I guess what I'm doing tonight is I've got a granddaughter that's in a school. I'm not going to call the school's name. Next week, they don't know nothing. They were on vacation all this week. Next week, at the end of the week, they're going to lose their teacher and get another teacher. Now, we've got a four-month window, and school will be out. And what I don't understand is, for kindergartners, why a teacher would be pulled out because of budget cuts and switch with another teacher that they want to put in there because of, I think it's seniority or... But you're, it's interrupting the lives of the child. Because from September until next week, you might as well say from September to February, those five-year-olds were used to that one teacher. And now from March on to June, they're gonna have another teacher. Mm -hmm. So I wish it was possible, Beatrice, for you to tell me what I need to do. You might not know. Well, it's tough because <laughs> seniority, again, is one of, it's a law. It's above the board level. We have to follow that process in terms of follow the law around seniority. And it is tough. Like, there were, kid, there were teachers in my daughter's school, too, um, that, yeah, that we lost it. Yeah, so I will say this, that it was, it is extremely unfortunate that teachers really paid the brunt of the mid-year cuts. Um, on the flip side of that, we hired a large number of teachers when we had a declining student enrollment, and that was something that our previous superintendent and administration did. And again, we all own the responsibility of that as well. Um, but the seniority clause is, is something that is above the, the preview and the authority of the board. We can't say we want to keep this teacher and ignore seniority because we want this teacher instead. Um, and it's unfortunate. I don't know. And, and you and I can have a follow-up conversation around this because I'm confused as to why there's a mid-year cut now in March anyway or in mid-February, um, why that would trickle down now when the cuts happen. And my understanding is all of this was already supposed to be squared away. So we'll have a, a sidebar conversation. So I just, I just have to be so no one thinks um, down the road when they get a different response that I was down with this response. I need to respond to um, why don't we just not pay some of the people? Um, I need you to know for me that I will never support that. That's how we got here. That's how we got in this hole we got. We was just had an attitude that we wasn't going to pay because um, we didn't have the money, but we still going to just implement some stuff. 
and this got us in this. This is not no normal. This is way beyond normal. This is a big, big hole. So I don't. I just don't want any. I mean, it sounds good as a way of not paying. We have to still pay. Um, so we just cannot be owing what we don't have. That's what got us in this hole. I mean, we we're beyond a hole. And so I just need. I don't want nobody to think they were here and thought that. Maybe all the school board commissioners were here, might have been in agreement with that. No, we have to find another way, and it might not be comfortable. Um, but I'm not going to support us not paying, because um, that's we start going down that path, we're going down the same path, and um, the state's coming in and taking over and running these schools with my kids, which is unacceptable for me. It's unacceptable, because they've been the problem all down the picture. I've been advocating for kids forever, and it's always been against the state's policy, and they've never come through. So to think that they might have the answer is crazy. So I have to do, make my decisions on this board, um, trying to keep them up out of here. Um, I, I, I really do, because at least, I, my kids got five or six more years in this district, um, and they mean everything to me, and so I'm gonna do everything I can to keep the state out of this district. I'm sorry. And so I just had to do that tra transparency. Okay. I totally understand what you're saying. Um, and it, it was kind of meant in jest, yeah. but not, it, only to the point of how do we get their attention? How do we get their attention? They're not paying us. How do we get their attention? We've written letters, we've went on buses, we've sent emails, we've contacted legislators. How the heck do we get their attention? I totally understand you. And I, I've never not paid my bills, so I, I get what you're saying, okay? I, I totally do. And we don't want anybody looking at us, but they are looking at us, because we're broke. We're more than broke. And we didn't get in this situation because we didn't pay our bills, we got in this situation because we didn't know what our bills were. We underestimated and we overspent, so. Oh. I'm a parent of four kids in the district. Um, so most of my questions have been answered or asked by other people. Um, I did want to, before I ask my question, just mention that when there are um, moments like the charter school whatever you call it, open forum. They're the hearings. Yes. yes. I, I feel like as a parent, I would love to be informed about when that happens so I can attend. I didn't even know those existed, to be quite honest. Um, but in addition to that, my question is more on like a specific level of, um, in the midst of all the cuts that are happening, happening is there um, a way to ensure, or do we have a plan to ensure that every student is gonna be taught by a certified teacher because there have already been cuts that have happened and I know that they're looking to do more cuts and it's my understanding there many classrooms are being covered by long-term subs at this point and I I mean in the hopes that all of our children would provided quality education I'm wondering how that's being addressed yeah so Bob is saying there's a national teaching shortage but um, first and foremost I think the use of long-term subs was also another area that we underestimated and, and then ended up overspending. Um, and this was my concern even when we were talking about these cuts, like how do we have one area of subs where we have overspent for subs, but then we're saying we have too many staff. Like some of those things need to correlate and they're not correlating. Um, I. I will put that question on the question log officially for the superintendent because again, the questions that we're not able to really answer or provide um, a good in-depth answer to, I want the superintendent and his team to address and I want it to be public and on our website. So certainly something we can look at. And it's also something that the board audit committee could also commit to ensuring as an area to audit and have some oversight to ensure that it remains balanced in that in that area yes um, I'm gonna take a risk here and try to get in the maybe get into trouble but um, maybe get into trouble but um, 
This room should be filled with parents. This room should be filled with parents. Um, and, you know, I think about it and, and I look around and there's not very many parents here. And I gotta scratch my head about that. And I think that there's some benefit in you folks going out and getting after the parents, doing something. We can write letters, we can go to Albany, but I'll bet you if there's 500 people in this room and there are people from the press, they will report that. The other thing is that, that you know, these kids in the city are also residents of Monroe County, you know? And there's some responsibility that suburban districts mm -hmm. have for all of our kids. Somehow we've got to get to them. I'm looking to you to lead. I'm looking to you folks to lead that, you know? To, to, to get out to churches, to get out to suburban districts and say, hey, listen, we've got to do something about this, you know? Um, I mean, this is nuts, just sitting, listening to, you know, not getting this 86 or 85, whatever it is, million dollars. I mean, it's just nuts. Um, and for suburban districts, I mean, I read about, you know, Rush Henrietta has got built a, uh, a terrific um, um, uh, facility. Uh, Pittsford has built this and that. Penfield has got that. This is crazy, you know? This is not fair. It's not reasonable. So somehow with 500 people in this room, it won't just be WXXI and, and the Democrat and Chronicle. It'll be the New York Times, you know? That's what ne needs to happen. And, and we've got to get out there and, and talk to people. I don't know who's going to do it. Please, you know, think about it. One more thing. What's the, what, what, is there a possibility to get to principals? To get to principals of schools, to get at, and to, uh, to um, parent liaisons, to talk to parents, to make them understand that this 86 million bucks is a big, big deal. So let me just say, um, no plan to yet to talk to principals, to parent liaisons. Um, and so when I started the presentation, I did mention that next year, this is gonna be a different process as well, because this will be at schools. Um, so that is our plan, is to bring it to parents. Um, as someone who does community outreach and engagement, and I do home visits every single day, I do social work, outreach, I look for clients of mine, wherever they're at. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that if, if I built it, people are gonna come. I think the same folks, I, I know almost half of the people in this room, I love half of the people in this room. <laughs> um, so I do believe we have to go where families are at, where our parents are at. Um, and because this is a new undertaking for us, it was not something that I don't, I don't wanna do it rush, I wanna do it correctly. And I also know that not only do I have to partner with my school principals and my parent liaisons, I also have to look at the area, uh, non-for-profit organizations that may exist around these neighborhoods and schools to partner with them as well to help us get folks to these um, schools when we go school to school. And it is a large undertaking. We've never un did this undertaking at this level before. I I'm not a fan. I'm a fan of old school guerrilla marketing, which is door to door, street to street, um, person to person and conversation. It is a large undertaking. Um, however, I would be totally open to having a different group work with me to then have those conversations and to do recruitment for folks to come out um, to talk about the advocacy piece that's needed for the state aid. I will totally partner with whoever wants to partner with me as I go from principal to principal because our vision, and I say ours because this is where 
One area strongly that the superintendent and I can agree on right now is that we should be including our parent liaisons and our principals and our vice principals and our school-based planning team and our PTA PTOs around this budget stuff um, because this is what we'll continue to get. So, um, so if anybody wants to join me in that and do the 86 million, I'll welcome it. Yes. reception. Thank you also for having welcomed us at one of those schools. Um, for Sean and myself or others, Stevie also from Citizen Action has been part of it. So we have done it like on a case by case basis, but it would be so great if that could be amplified and like um, routinized or some way, you know, so that, like everyone was um, helping coordinate that. And of course, I mean, I'm not trying to own like the, that we're the advocates, the only advocates, but Citizen Action certainly is and has been allied with uh, Alliance for Quality Education, AQE. And so, I mean, we do have these resources and I think it's a great idea if the principals could jump on board and like invite yeah, Citizen Action to come and meet with their parents. It's, it, I mean, there's not much time. We only have a few weeks before the state budget gets formulated. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. We have one more question and then we're going to wrap up, but I do want to read some of the questions. Um, I don't, we didn't get to do some of the questions that were submitted online, so what I will probably do is have our staff post all of them with answers, because some of these we went through and some of these you guys already asked. So I'll end with our last parent here. Hi, Beatrice. Hi. I am... Um, a community member and the parent of a child in RCSD and I want to know I heard you talking earlier about um, the priorities of the board and I want to know what is being done to solicit the um, priorities of parents community members and families and how if is there an official way just to have it on record and as you said it's being um, done live and how does a parent community member say this is my priority and is that even being taken into consideration in the budget? So good question. We've, we've had some back and forth around this. Um, so for this year, the board priorities is really just a guide for the superintendent um, to uh, on things that we're just not going to support. And I always go back to restorative practices because I can tell you even last year, that was the first thing that the interim superintendent was trying to cut and we had to kind of go back and forth. Um, we parents have at any time can always email or reach out to school board members like you have a fundamental right to reach out to your school board liaisons and so forth um, are we going to do a forum to collect uh, uh, parent and community priorities i don't have a forum plan for that um, however that does not mean that parents cannot speak to and submit those that information we are going to have an online link like we did for this one with the google doc where people can submit questions and certainly i can go back and talk with staff and they, they, they created this feedback form today. I came in, I was like, hey, we didn't do an assessment for this. And they did that while we were here. So it's certainly something that we can put together and have that live by next week to start collecting feedback um, from the community. But I do want to stress that the reason that I've also asked the board priorities is because 55 to $60 million to cut it is not going to be an easy process, and I have said this repeatedly over and over and over again, and I've said it so much, I know people get tired of me saying it, it's just going to be a painful, painful process. Um, and so if, if the board has not finalized their priorities, but if there are priorities on there that you agree or don't agree with as well, we, again, we welcome that feedback. Um, but we did try as a board to, everybody got to submit however many recommendations. There was no limits to the amount of recommendations board members were allowed to submit. And as a board, we decided which ones based on a vote. Um, but if once those are finalized by next Thursday, if you see that there are things that are lacking in what you would want as a parent or as a community member, certainly feel free. You, well, you know, you can reach out. But I will make a formal process for any parent um, to be able to submit. But I do think um, it's going to be important to look at what the board finalized as a list and then say this is not enough or these are areas that we want 
the board to really fight and support. And I'll give an example, Commissioner Shepard, I'm gonna put her on the spot because she had um, fund early literacy. And the way it was written, we didn't have an in-depth conversation about it, but I was like, I don't know what that really means. And so I didn't support it at first. I was like, you know, we, we did a vote up and down on each one. And then um, she and I are friends, so we're on social media. I saw she, this is what she meant by it, and she clarified. And I was like, girl, you should have talked about that at the board meeting because I didn't know what you were talking about. So I called her, and I was like, hey, I think you should reach back out to all the board members in the same way you clarified that for me, clarify it for them, because I think you would get the board to support you on that. Um, and she wants to ensure that we fund reading teachers in the schools and so forth. So. Um, so next Thursday we'll have a finalized list, but I will make sure a link goes up at the very minimum that link goes up. But March 25th, let me just stress this piece too. March 25th, the budget will have been out. The priorities have been out, but I really want March 25th to be a two-way conversation for all of us with administration and different board members um, to provide feedback. Hey, I saw you're cutting in this area. Did you know that if you cut here, these are the consequences? Um, because we can't know everything, so we don't know all the consequences to all the cuts. Um, so yes, alert us, tell us, and have those conversations. Come with ideas on March 25th too. And, um, and I'm gonna shut up now. And I'm gonna finish with you. You'll be my very, very last person. Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna bring the mic over. Is it possible to have these meetings at the uh, rec centers? What was Is it possible to have these meetings at the rec centers in the city? There are different ones. Actually, that was just one question. Just three other questions, and they're directed to um, the CFO. And what percentage of the budget is the deficit? I'd like to know that. And I'd also like to know if there are some innovative, innovative finance strategies that are on the board. I'm not a finance person. My area is not, you know, a CPA. I mean, but I have to think that someone, a group of someone, have some innovative approaches. Because what does it mean when you have this budget cut? What does that mean for education five years from now? So the cuts are a step to get the budget balanced. But what does it mean for education in the short and the long run. We know what it means for the short run, but for the long run? So that was I'm like bring Bob the, <laughs> the mic back. The first part of your question was the deficit. Um, and I'm gonna suggest that you're talking about the forecasted 55 to $60 million deficit for the next school year. So we have about a 900, and I'm just going to call it a 950 million dollar budget. So 60 million divided by 950—that's you know, I don't know six, seven percent. So it's statistically significant, that's for sure. Um, short term versus long term—you know—I appreciate the tension between the short term and the long term, but I will say there will be no long term without a short term. So we have to have a balanced budget for this uh, school year that has yet to end, and we have to have a balanced budget going into the next school year, and that will happen. A lot of questions about wanting to know exactly what's going to get cut today, tonight, New York State has not offered any additional funding. I don't know what they're gonna to say tomorrow or the day after that. But if the answer is zero, we're gonna to have to find 55 to $60 million within a $950 million budget. And it's not gonna be pleasant. And I think a lot of areas are gonna see the impact of that. There's just no other way around it. That is a cold but hard fact. For the long term, however, 
we need to live to fight another day. We have to get our house, our fiscal house in order today so that we can be here next year. And we have to make that happen. And I don't want to cast aspersions on anyone who came before me because I didn't walk in their shoes, but I will tell you that our budget, our budget director, myself, and our superintendent are committed to a balanced budget and an honest budget without gimmicks, without shortchanging appropriations that we know are going to be overspent in the long run. But being honest about that is going to require even more hard decisions because when the numbers hit you in the face and you refuse to back down, that requires a hard choice. But it's critical we make those hard choices so we'll be here for our children in the years to come. I think um, as far as your question about innovative financing, this is a tougher, this is a tougher, education is a tougher industry. Um, I'll say when, in my previous employment at the county, it was a wide range of industries with a wide range of funding sources. We could be a little more creative and innovative in how we approach the spending and the financing. A, a school district, however, we are funded by the government. And we don't raise our own taxes. So we are completely beholden to New York State, the city of Rochester, and the federal government. There's very little local school district opportunities to raise our own funds. Um, I would love to have uh, more in-depth conversations with the city finance director, the city CFO, because I think our capital improvement program and how we bond out our capital projects um, could provide us some opportunities. Um, the magnitude of the dollars, I don't know, would be as significant as we need it to be. Um, but I'll always take a million dollars, right? I appreciate where you're coming from. My challenge tonight is the fact that I've been here a month and a half. But I've come a long way in a month and a half. At least I'm up, uh, speaking to you all and looking you in the eye. Um, I have every bit of confidence in the, both the budget team and the accounting team at the school district. They're good people and they're smart people. I have confidence that I have a good working relationship with our budget director. Um, I will pat myself on the back and let you know that when I was the county CFO, we improved the fund balance for the county. It was virtually nothing, and we, in the course of six years, brought that up to 6.1% of general fund revenues. We increased the bond rating four times in three years. So we have the experience within the finance department, and we have strong leadership in our superintendent and our deputy superintendent. So I'm, I'm, on the one hand, being new is, is almost um, um, a crutch is not the right word. Um, it's a struggle, but the team we have in place gives this district great opportunity and right now we're going to solve the current fiscal year problem and we're going to put together a balanced budget for the next school year but we have the team that's going to give this school district opportunity three years four years five years from now
just clarify too, and then we're gonna wrap up the, when he set the fund balance, that's essentially like our savings account, so he had money that was put into the savings for the county. They didn't have any savings, and that's where we're at right now. We have no, we have a no fund balance, so we definitely need to start saving again. So I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, really, really, really for your time. We, I love your feedback. It's on the RCSD. If you just put rcsd.org budget town hall, but we will have that on the RCSD website. We'll post it on our social media if you're involved in the social media. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you March 25th. And also you can email board members at any time. That's what we are elected to do. So just want to throw that out there. Thank you again.